Hello again everyone, Kevin Newsom here, continuing the uh, Discipleship from a Distance video series I started last week on uh, ways to help you study your Bible more effectively as you're spending more time at home. Hopefully you're spending some more time digging into the Word of God, um, and we want to be able to equip you to do that better. I was going through the uh, Seven Arrows, uh, of, from this Seven Arrows book from an equipping study I did uh, a little while back and last week I went over the first arrow and today uh, I want to go over the second arrow so just a quick review the first arrow is what does this passage say and we uh, want to look at things like genre and writing style to get at the plain meaning of the text of what we're seeing right there in front of us the second arrow is what the, does this or, or rather what did this passage mean to the original audience um, now as we are uh, asking these two questions we are trying to get as much context surrounding what we're reading as we possibly can and so this second arrow uh, invites us to get the bigger historical context um, and to do this a lot of times we're going to have to use some tools uh, cross references maps uh, Bibles and things like that so we're going to go over a few of those things I want you to know that um, the writers of these books in the Bible they were writing for a specific audience at a specific time and, and the the wonderful uh, thing about the Word of God is that it, it transcends audiences it transcends times and um, and it has application and meaning for us here today even though we're not uh, uh, the Jews that were uh, being written to at the time in the Old Testament um, but the original writers were writing with a specific intention for a specific audience. Uh, and so when we try to try to understand what these scriptures mean to us, one of the most important steps we need to do is to try to figure out what that scripture meant to the first hearers of it. Um, and then we can take that meaning and begin the process of, of application. So we want to find out what does the scripture mean. You will possibly need tools. You want When you're looking for tools, you want to find quality tools, not necessarily complex tools. If, if you don't have the uh, skill level to, to deal with uh, Greek and Hebrew, then, then don't get tools that have Greek and Hebrew in it. Use the tools that uh, work best for you um, and, and ones that you can understand the best. Um, be, be wary of internet sources. Uh, the internet can be a very helpful tool. It can be uh, extremely informative if you use it correctly. Um, but just remember, a lot of times Google can be like a well-dressed salesman. He might look nice and tr trustworthy, but the truth is he's probably trying to trick you into something. And, and just because you find it on Google doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. So be careful with your Google sources. Some of the sources you are going to want to use and some that are, are readily available. Um, Cross-references. So cross-references are found in just about every Bible nowadays. Uh, a lot of times you'll find them in the center here. Uh, these are cross-references to the scriptures pointing you to other scriptures in the Bible. And what these are for is to allow you the, the ability to quickly check other places in scripture that use similar themes, similar words, so that you can see a, a broader context of, of how that those words are being used throughout scripture or, or how a an author uses a specific word or how uh, how an author might reference other scriptures so you can check the reference that he's made um, and and this all helps us get a better understanding of what the original audience would have understood from that passage um, maps of course there are occasions where you might want to consult a map if the uh, scripture is giving you uh, directional information a lot of times a map would help some understanding of the geography um, you'll find in in the New Testament a lot of times in the Gospels it, it might say something like uh, they went up to Jerusalem um, and that might sound weird to us um, until you begin to look at the geography and the topography of the area and you, you understand that there's there's a low area uh, near the sea and they would actually go up um, in elevation to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is, is at a much higher elevation than, than at the sea. So um, 
understanding some of the geography using your maps. Most of your Bibles will have maps in the back of them. Uh, so consult those maps, especially when you're given uh, a direction information. Bible dictionaries are also helpful if you uh, don't know the definition of a specific word, objects, events, things like that that were are, are referenced. Get a better understanding of what those things are by using Bible dictionaries. Um, you can also find surveys. Surveys are, are short, big picture views of a particular book, usually no more than a couple of pages long, give you the historical context, the themes, the theological implications, the political issues, the the, the challenges you may face in interpreting some of those scriptures, the, the background of the author, the setting in which the book was written. These, these are extremely um, useful uh, for understanding uh, what the writer is writing about. For example, um, Checking a survey about the book of Ephesians will inform you that it was written by Paul while he was imprisoned in Rome, and it was one of the last things that he wrote. So with that in mind, you might look at, say, Ephesians 6.10, which is the armor of God, a little bit differently, knowing that he is in prison while he's writing it, and it's one of the final things that he wrote. Um, helps you get a better picture of it. Commentaries, of course. Uh, there are lots of commentaries. You can see commentaries on my shelf back here. Uh, Pastor Craig has commentaries. Pastor Adam uh, and Pastor Buster all have commentaries in their offices. There are commentaries in our library. Uh, go to a commentary. See what other scholars have, have to say concerning that scripture. Um, but don't lean on them too heavily. Uh, they don't replace the Bible. Um, and they usually reflect the work and the scholarship done by one person, and so they're not infallible. In fact, a lot of times you'll find commentaries will differ and disagree with one another. So it's okay if you disagree with one, but just know this, if, if you do disagree with a commentary, uh, you need to have some justification for your disagreement. Check other commentaries, other biblical scholars, see if there are any that uh, uh, voice an opinion that that you have as well. If you find that you're the lone wolf, you're the only one that has that opinion and you've checked multiple commentaries and lots of sources concerning a scripture, the chances are that you're the one that's wrong. Uh, so just use as many sources as you can in order to refine your interpretation and your understanding of scripture. Let commentaries be a compass that points you in the right, in the right direction. Also, don't forget that, uh, don't neglect to use your pastors as resources. We're, we're here to serve you. We're here to help you, to help guide you and teach you um, how to better understand the scripture and, and guide you into a better relationship uh, with God. So don't forget about us. Feel free to approach us. Every one of us will will or will help you with any question that you have. Just so you know, some of you may not be aware Um of, of, of what kind of resources your, your pastors bring to the church. Pastor Craig has a, uh, an MDiv from Southern in Apologetics. He has a PhD in Evangelism and Church Growth. I have a uh, master's from New Orleans in Theology, specializing in Apologetics with a transcript double in Biblical Studies. Pastor Adam is currently working on his master's from Southeastern. Pastor Buster has a certificate in Religious Studies from Liberty University. Um, and combined, I would say all four of us uh, represent probably about 20 years or more of theological training. And we are here to serve you. We're here to serve the church. So don't forget about us. Ask us your questions um, concerning the scriptures. And we are more than, more than happy to help you find the resources, point you to the right direction, and help you uh, with your understanding of those passages. Um, if you have a good study Bible... Uh, a lot of study Bibles will have all of these things built into them. Uh, I've already shown you a Bible with cross-references. Uh, most of you are familiar with the maps. I have here a study Bible that is one of my go-to study Bibles. And in the front of this study Bible, in the front of every book, is a short survey of that book which gives me title, author, and date, background and setting, his, historical, theological themes, and an outline of that book so that I can better understand how that book was written and why it was written and who it was written to. 
Also in the back of my study Bible uh, is a um, abbreviated Bible dictionary. And in this study Bible as well, at the bottom of passages is a section of commentary notes. Um, it is not a full set of commentary notes like you would find in, in a, a larger commentary, um, but it's an abbreviated uh, commentary down there. So in that one study Bible, I have a lot of these tools that I, I use to help me understand the scriptures that I'm reading. So a good study Bible is a must-have. If you don't have a good study Bible, one of uh, a couple of that I recommend. Uh, I use the MacArthur Study Bible. Uh, also, um, really uh, impressed with the CSB Study Bible. Uh, we have a lot of people who use the Apologetic Study Bible. Uh, there's uh, lots of others, Life Application Study Bibles, as well. So find a good study Bible. Um, uh, if, if you have questions about one, I'm sure there's somebody here. If I don't have it, uh, or, or Pastor Craig or somebody doesn't have a copy of one of these study Bibles you want to find out more about, I'm sure somebody in the church does. So we will try to find an example of that so that you can look, look through it if you uh, want to do that. So a couple of things I want to... Um, uh, I want to go over a couple of scriptures because I want to give you some examples of what this means. So the whole whole point of this second arrow, what did this passage mean to its original audience? Using all of these tools to get to the original meaning as understood by the audience, the original audience, and as communicated by the original author. So I want to read for you um, a couple of verses out of uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 begin with verse 1 it says when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate they asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel on the first day of the seventh month the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men women and all who could listen with understanding he was facing the square in front of the water gate he read out of it from daybreak until noon before the men the women and those who could understand all the people listened attentively to the book of the law the scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose and and there's a list of uh, uh, um, assistants who were repeating um, what Ezra was reading from his elevated platform and so we get this description and 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 we try to picture it in our mind and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because it says the entire gathering of Israel men women and everybody who could understand were there and, and they didn't have the technology to amplify voices and everything so they built this wooden platform but we get this uh, we get this description that he was at the square in front of the water gate so when you consult your resources your geography your maps and everything uh, about what's going on here you find that the water gate is at the southern end of Jerusalem and it's called the water gate because this is this is where all the the running water coming down from the hillside in Jerusalem uh, gathers and, and, and it passes out uh, through the wall um, through the water gate so this is this is the gate that's next to that uh, where the water would pass through so what we have here is he is at the bottom of lowest point of elevation at the city which means when everybody gathered they're gathering uphill from him so everybody can see him he's on a raised platform and so everybody can see him and in this configuration his voice is going to travel a lot further than it would on flat ground so understanding the geography helps us to understand a little bit more of the picture of what's going on in the scripture uh, one more verse I want to look at Jeremiah 29 11 a lot of you have this verse memorized for I know the plans I have for you plans for your well-being not for disaster to give you a future and a hope and a lot of people uh, memorize this verse because it does give them some comfort it does give them some hope but a lot of times this uh, this verse can be misused because we are not taking the time to answer this second arrow what did the passage mean to the original audience and so Jeremiah is writing, uh, he's recording this. These are the words, uh, words coming from God to his people Israel who are in captivity. And so when you get this whole context of, of who's speaking, who's writing, and who's listening to it, 
the verse takes on a slightly different meaning. Uh, it is God saying, For I know the plans I have for you, specifically Israel, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future. Uh, so to the Israelites, a future and hope would be this hope and this future of returning to their homeland and, and reestablishing and rebuilding Jerusalem, rebuilding their home. That's the future. That's the hope they're looking for. So this is a very specific promise to a specific people at a specific time in history um, in, in, the, in, the past, in Israel's past uh, while they were in captivity. So to, to take this verse and pluck it out of that context and to just say a blanket statement that that God has made plans for me and those plans are to to uh, prosper me to give me uh, a beautiful future and a beautiful hope but uh, that's that's not being uh, that's that's not being accurate to what's going on in the passage we've got to get the context so we know the plain meaning of it we get the context of it. Now we begin to uh, uh, take application and interpretation of it. And so we, we can say, well, God knows the plans that he had for Israel, plans to give Israel uh, well-being, to, to keep Israel from further disaster, to keep to give Israel a future and a hope. And, and when we take that application to us, we can, we can say, it, we can have the comfort knowing that God's plans are bigger than we are. And though we don't understand always what those plans are, we can trust that God's plans are better than any plans we could ever have. Um, even though we may not be in such a place uh, as Israel was at the time, in a place in captivity, they were in a very dark place when God gave them this promise. We're not in that same place, very, most of us. Um, but we can have the hope and the promise that, that God keeps his plans and he will enact his plans for us according to his will. Um, and, and that's just as much uh, of encouragement and just as much hope um, as we could get out of from taking the verse out of context. So know what the passage says, know what the passage meant to its original audience and, and what the original writer meant by writing it. Know these things, use all the tools and resources that you have available to you to learn these things um, before you even begin to try to make some kind of, some kind of application of the passage. All right, so next week I'll do another video on the third arrow. The third arrow is what does this passage tell us about God? Uh, so you can read uh, some of this on the, the quick reference that I uploaded to the Facebook group. Um, so print those out for, you, uh, for yourselves. Stick those in your Bibles as you're studying your Bible. Um, and make sure that you uh, practice studying the Bible well. Um, practice learning and, and applying uh, context to your understanding um, before you uh, begin to try to make application. So I hope you are studying your Bible. hope that you're reading consistently. And I hope that you're staying safe. We hope to see you soon. We hope to see you uh, uh, at least wave to you from uh, while you're in your cars at Easter. You'll be hearing some more about that later. Um, so have a great day and uh, thank you for watching.